Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the BRSI World Affairs Series. And it's, it's good to see real people in real buildings again. So thank you very much for taking the time today to, to make an appearance. We've also got a sizable audience online. So this is another one of our hybrid lectures. So just a few admin issues from the beginning. Uh, first of all, uh, for those of you in the, in the room, in the case of the fire alarm ringing, which is unlikely, but possible, please make your way in an orderly manner down the stairs you came up on, out of the building, turn right, and then turn right again at the end, and then assemble by the green of the little chapel there. So that's relatively straightforward, and, uh, but it's not unlikely to happen, so don't worry. Now, let's just send more people in online. For the online audience of you, uh, I just want to go through this sort of etiquette of Zoom. Um, one is this is being a recorded lecture, so this will appear on the BLSI virtual YouTube channel in about four weeks' time. So uh, Rob will be eternalized forever and ever, which I'm sure he'd be delighted about. And uh, the other thing is there's three ways of asking questions. You can unmute yourself later on. Uh, at the moment, you can't unmute or show your video. When we get to the Q&A session, you will be able to. So you can ask questions in one of three ways. You can ask questions either throughout the presentation in the chat room, and I shall pick them up and then put them to uh, Rob at the end. Alternatively, when we come to the Q&A, you can unmute yourself, show the video, and just raise your hand in the good old honored way. Alternatively, you can use the Zoom raise your hand functionality. I think that's about it as far as admin is concerned for, for both audiences. So it is with great pleasure that uh, I will uh, be able to announce Rob Wortham to you uh, tonight on a fantastic talk on artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has been on the UN register of existential threats or issues for decades. And it was only, it was only uh, at number one until very recently, because the other two are climate change, and many of us still think that climate change is decades away, and therefore we don't need to worry about it just as much as artificial intelligence yet. But at, no, at number two was nuclear holocaust. And that was at number two. If you look at the latest UN list, I think artificial intelligence may have been de denigrated to number two at the moment. So we're living in, in very uncertain times. But as far as artificial intelligence is concerned, I'm not sure where Rob will actually start, whether he's going to start with the automatons in ancient Greece, as far as AI is concerned, or start with the history of AI in a slightly more modern way in the 20th century. But uh, it is with great, great pleasure that I would like to introduce to you Dr. AI from Bath University, Rob Wortham. <laughs> Thank you, Andres, for your warm welcome. And um, it is really, really good to be standing here uh, after quite a long pause uh, uh, here again at Brilsey. Um, so um, thank you very much to those of you who've turned out tonight to listen to this talk. I, I hope you find it interesting. Thank you also to those of you at home who have uh, connected via Zoom. Um, I hope you equally find it interesting. And of course, I'll know because I can see how many people remain connected for the whole, for the whole duration. So. Uh, so I'm kind of watching you in the same way that you're watching me. Um, <laughs> so tonight, um, what I want to do is to, is to uh, cheat a little bit, if you don't mind. I, I give a, a, a lecture to my uh, undergraduate students, second year undergraduates, also in computer science, some of the, the master's students as well that take robotics and some of the PhD students. And um, uh, the, the course is an introduction to artificial intelligence and uh, this is the second lecture. The first lecture is just, you know, housekeeping and what we're going to do and so on. And this is the second lecture. Um, and then uh, there's another 21 lectures after that, where we actually go through uh, all of the stuff I'm talking about today, but in much more detail to kind of cover the breadth of what AI is and how you might use it. And they have assignments where they do programming uh, and, and do various things. I'll mention that as we go through the talk. But I've, I've taken those slides. I thought it might be quite interesting for you to actually see the slides that students in universities who are being taught AI, that, that what they are. And I've added one or two extra things in as well to just to make it a little bit more interesting and taken some bits out that are a bit too technical. But it is kind of based on that talk. Um, so this, this, this is not me on the left-hand side here. Um, 
and we'll get to those guys in a in a moment. Um, but uh, as Andreas, I uh, can't remember what his introduction said, but I'm um, I'm a senior lecturer in robotics and autonomous systems at the University of Bath, and um, I also am responsible for a small uh, cohort of students who are studying robotics uh, and autonomous systems at a master's level. Uh, and actually that cohort's getting bigger every year. So this year, but there was 23 students. Um, and I teach them a, a, range of, a range of subjects, no longer this AI, in fact, this year, but, uh, uh, but various other things, programming of, of, of robots and so on. So what I'm, the reason I say that is because quite a lot of my examples will be in the context of robots, because that's really where I've been working and what I know best. So um, please bear with me, but not all AI is about robots and I'll try and just be a bit more general when I can. Um, okay, so that's a kind of by way of, a, by way of a, an introduction. So for, let's go for a little history. Uh, I'm not going back quite as far as, uh, as the golem and the, all those sort of historical sort of fear mongering things about AI, but I'm gonna go back as far as this, which is the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on artificial intelligence. And this was some very bright guys, uh, academic guys who had the summer, I don't know if you know, at, 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 um, in America, um, uh, academics don't get paid in the summer unless they can find a research grant to pay them, their university doesn't pay them. Uh, so uh, so th these guys were fairly free, they got some research money from the military and uh, so they went to Dartmouth to do this research project on artificial intelligence. And it was gonna be a two month study it was going to solve the problem, in fact, of artificial intelligence. They were going to solve it. And, and you know, uh, these were not sort of idiots. These were smart guys. So the names, who these were just young guys at this point, but we've got Marvin Minsky. He's the, uh, actually, I've got a pointer here. I'll try and do that for people at home. This guy's Marvin. So uh, we lost Marvin a couple of years ago, sadly, but Marvin was um, the head of the AI media, uh, sorry, it's called the Media Lab, uh, MIT. Um, for many years. He uh, supervised Rodney Brooks uh, uh, for his PhD. Uh, Rodney Brooks started um, um, many robotics companies. <laughs> he moved some robotics company to robotics company and our, Boston Dynamics was the big one. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, Rodney Brooks supervised my supervisor at, at, at MIT. Uh, and so I kind of feel I am Having read quite a lot of Marvin Minsky's books, I feel I'm the sort of academic grandchild of, of Minsky, in fact, <laughs> which is nice. John McCarthy was kind of a, the ringleader of all of this. And um, he said every aspect of learning, he said this the year before, every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can be, he's asserting, can be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So he said, we can describe every aspect of what intelligence is. We can talk about what intelligence may or may not be, but if we describe it accurately enough, we could simulate it and we could have a machine do it. And this is what they're aiming to do in the Dartmouth pro pro um, the summer uh, research projects. They had two whole months to do this. So obviously probably had some time to spare. Um, we're moving down, you've got um, Shannon, Shannon's information theory, anyone know that? Okay, very, very important for communications technologies. John Nash, anybody seen the film, The Beautiful Mind? Yeah, so John Nash, uh, he uh, developed game theory, which kind of fundamentally changed the world of economics. Um, Herb Simon, a uh, big name, and Alan Newell, who I will mention uh, a bit later on, uh, designed cognitive architectures for robots, uh, one of his things. Uh, and so these were massive guys. And this is where it kind of started. So they coined the, coined the term artificial intelligence. And this was kind of a development of a paper that this is Alan Turing, uh, that he wrote in 1950 for Mind, the journal Mind. And, it, uh, and uh, the paper was called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. So he was one of the first people to ever think, hang on a minute, computing, um, maybe what humans do in their heads is computing or something. And, is that what intelligence he's trying to put those two things together for the first for the first time remember the state of computers back then was electromechanical machines really there was no um bipolar transistor hadn't been invented there was obviously there was just no transistors let alone no chips 
So we were talking about some valves and some relays and some mechanical rotating devices. Uh, and um, he um, postulated this question, can machines think? Uh, and he more or less came to the conclusion, well, that depends what you think thinking is. And I completely agree with him. I think now with a bit more hindsight, we can say that there's a better answer, which is it's not a very useful question. You know this idea uh, in philosophy that there are good questions to ask and there are questions which are so heavily biased in the question. They're not a very good question in the first place. I think this is one of them because thinking is a word that implies the behavior that we humans exhibit. That's what thinking, you know, when we think about thinking, we think about humans thinking, us, us thinking, we uh, use a theory of mind, we think that other people are thinking the way that we're thinking. If we think about animals thinking, that's really anthropomorphism. We're really sort of uh, giving the animal human characteristics in order to think about how it thinks. So machines are not human, so they can't exhibit that behavior of human thinking. And therefore the question is biased and it relies on us attributing human qualities to machines. So it relies on this uh, um, curse, really, of anthropomorphism. And I've spoken about that before here, I think. So that's not really for tonight. So timeline, this is a history thing. So I thought let's have a big arrow. And we'll put uh, the Turing test and the Dartmouth uh, uh, summer project. We'll put that on the, on the chart. There is one thing to go back to, and that's Babbage. So uh, Charles Babbage designed a, uh, a mechanical, purely mechanical computer. He never finished building it, uh, but someone has built it since then, and it did work, which could do multiplication and more challengingly division, for example. Um, and he discussed programming a computer. His, his idea of a computer was a big mechanical thing uh, to play chess. So he thought there was some relation between that mechanical system and, and solving chess, which in 1845 was jolly radical because at that point it was thought that the most complex thing there was really, the most sort of high level thing to think about was chess. And if you could do chess, then, you know, all other intelligence would fall, would just fall before you. And actually the interesting thing is that these guys at Dartmouth pretty much thought the same thing. They thought if we could solve these hard problems, problems that are hard for, for humans. Let's let that ambulance pass. There it goes. So like chess playing, if we could solve those problems and everything else would just drop out the wash. So the hard problems back then were, were chess. Um, <laughs> so I'm just gonna whiz through this quickly just to show you how sort of slow it progressed so they didn't solve all the problems in 1955. Of course, they didn't. In fact, it took another 13 years for them to come up with an algorithm that's called A-star, which is just a simple way of doing heuristic search uh, um, through a state space. So what that really means is if you think about the way your sat-nav plans a route from A to B, it has to search all the different ways it could go and all the possible routes to get from you know, Bath to Edinburgh. There's lots of ways, there's lots of roads. So it has to search all of those to work out the best route. Uh, and that's, uh, um, that's a kind of computational explosion, okay? Because there are, there are probably millions of discrete ways in which you could get from, from Bath to Edinburgh. Uh, and the idea was that, you know, computing all of those is a huge job. With modern computers, it's in fact not a huge job, but with slow computers, it would be a huge job. And uh, A-star is really about using heuristics, so to prune that search space down. So it's a simple search algorithm. I, I teach it in week two or something. Uh, student program it, it's you know, not a hard thing, but it took them 13 years to come up with that. And I just think that's really interesting how stuff which we now consider to be you know, trivial and obvious took so much time to be developed. Then 1989, moving on, I think this was a next real big milestone. This was Q learning. This is the beginning of something called reinforcement learning. And the idea with reinforcement learning is that we uh, have a system that is kind of bootstrapped with some policy. So some way of uh, being able to solve a problem. Imagine a robot that has to make a cup of tea or something. So we bootstrapped it with some kind of way of, it may even be random how it should make a cup of tea or navigate around the room or something. 
Uh, and sometimes it does well using that policy, and sometimes it does badly. And it gets a reward when it does well, okay? So to start with, it would do very badly, and it would just randomly keep fiddling around with its policy until all of a sudden it starts to sometimes do some things well. And then that reinforces that behavior. So it's more likely now to do that thing again the next time. So the idea is you get a reward. And the idea is that you, uh, you improve your policy until it's a, it's, it's a very good policy. Interestingly, one of the key things about Q learning is sometimes you have to go off policy. So sometimes you have to deliberately do something which is worse because then you'll find other solutions. And I think we humans do this. You know, we drive to work every day and we take the right route. We know what the right route is and we drive the right route. Sometimes, though, we just take a wrong turn. We go off policy. We take a wrong turn and we discover things as a result of it. We learn things. We might learn it was a dead end. Still something we've learned. It's not terribly useful. But we might learn that there's a better route or a quicker route. Uh, so there's things when you make mistakes that you learn. And if you think about it, if you always do the right thing, you've never learned anything. So in order to do the right thing, you have to make some mistakes. I always say to students, you want to learn as much as possible, make as many mistakes as you can, because it's mistakes that causes learning to happen. Doing something, getting it wrong, changing the way you do it, that's what learning is. So that was reinforcement learning. That only really came along in 1989, not very long ago. And it's still a research area. It's, it's a big research area at Bath. And there aren't that many applications for a reinforcement learning in the real world. There are in games. We'll get on and talk about that in a moment. So uh, 1997 was when the Deep Blue, the IBM Deep Blue com uh, computer beat uh, Gary Kasparov at chess. Some of you will probably remember when that happened. Um, there, was, um, there was no Q learning in that. This was simple combinatorial stuff. Um, so there was uh, A star in it. Uh, and there was some heuristics which were calculated by very smart people uh, about what are good board positions and what are bad board positions. So let's just think about chess for a moment, um, dwell on chess, because I've mentioned this combinatorial explosion, but let's just try and explain that, that challenge. It's one of the central challenges to artificial intelligence. Um, let me just try and explain that a little bit. So how many valid uh chess boards are there valid uh, arrangements of chess pieces on a chess board do you think there might be so obviously not all the pieces have to be there some of them might have been taken the rest like the white bishop can only be on the white square so he can't be on the black squares but a lot of the other pieces can be on any square right the castles can be on any the rooks can be on any square and so on so if we added up all of the possible boards we could look at how many boards might there be any idea at all no, this is just just this is just um, make, trying to make an estimate. It's actually a very hard estimate to make about how many possible chessboards there are. Um, if you wrote down a one and put fifty two noughts after it, that's how many. Okay, that many. Just to give you some context for that very big number, there are one with 82 noughts after it, atoms in the whole universe. Okay, So it's a lot less than the number of atoms in the universe, but nevertheless, it's you know, one with 52 noughts after it is a very, very big number. And the idea is, if there's that many possible sort of combinations, some of those will be winning combinations, some of those will be checkmates, won't they? And some of them will be losings, so that's where someone else has got checkmate on you. So... Uh, if we're aiming for one of those probably billions and billions and billions of checkmate positions, and we've got a board at the moment, which is one of 10 to the 52 boards, what move do we make? If we're going to search, because we could make a move, then the other player could make a move, then we could make a move. We've got to scan all of those, try and work out which one's the best, keep on going. That tree branches out. The branching factor on that tree is absolutely enormous. So after four moves each, there are six from from start. There are sixteen billion possible boards that you could arrange come to, just after four moves each. Okay, so how can I search all of that? That's the combinatorial explosion. That's just impossible. That we can't. That's just oh, no one could do that. So therefore, we can't build computers that can play chess. Well, yes, you can. Yes, you can because you can use heuristics to prune the search space. 
you can say what good board positions look like and what poor board positions look like. You can look so far into the future and then you can rank each of the positions of each of the pieces to say whether, the, and then you can basically do that sort of top level search down to so many uh, moves ahead. You can look so many, depending on the size of your computer, how many moves ahead, and then you wait. So then you try and work out what the best move is from that. It's quite easy to do. Four weeks in, my students could build a chess computer that did that. And I think it's really interesting that some of them can't play chess very well. I can't play chess very well at all. I could build a computer algorithm, though, that could play chess much better than I could play. So it can play, build it. I know how to build an algorithm that would play chess better than I can play chess. And immediately you can see the smartest problem is not solving chess. The difficult problems are not, problems with intelligence are not solving chess. Chess is easy. What, what's the reason why chess is easy? Anyone? There's two reasons, really. Two fundamental reasons why chess and all board games are so easy. It, yeah, so first of all, all the information you need is there on the board. Everything's on the board. There's no unknowns. Everything you need is there on the board. Second is it's a thing called a Markov process. You don't need to know all the history of all the possible moves that got you to this position. You only need to look at the board as it is now to decide what move you're going to make. What happened before, irrelevant. In order to make the best move, look at the board now. Everything's there, and we've only got to consider what's happening now. Two reasons why board games are so easy. Okay, so moving on in my history line, 2005, the first successful DARPA Grand Challenge. So every year, uh, there's a DARPA Grand Challenge, an AI challenge uh, set by the US military with huge, huge funding, of course. 2004, they didn't pump quite enough money into it, so they never, no one actually achieved this. 2005, they had a million pound first prize, I think, or million dollars or something. And the challenge was just to drive an autonomous vehicle, so this is a car with no driver, uh, through the desert. It wasn't a, a difficult, it was just drive it through the desert. There was a road, you had to follow the road. 2005 was when that happened. So that's a much, much simpler problem than autonomous driving around Bath, for example. No pedestrians, really no other traffic. Uh, there might be the old yak or something to avoid perhaps, but that was basically it. And you just had to sort of follow the road and get from one end to the other. 2005. So neural networks are lots banged on about, I and mean, everybody knows about or knows of the term neural networks, at least even if you don't know the detail of what's inside the box. But neural networks didn't actually prove commercially useful uh, until 2012. Uh, this was in doing classification of images. So you'd look at an image and the computer would tell you what's, what's in the image and it would do it reliably enough that you could make decisions based on that. And that didn't really happen until 2012. So you could uh, say, well, with certain level of confidence, this picture on the left here is a mite. Uh, with sort of lower levels of confidence, it might be a black widow spider or a cockroach or a tick or a starfish. And you could get that kind of output from a neural network to show it the picture, it would tell you, okay? We'll talk a lot more about neural networks in a moment, but the idea really is this about classification. That's where it started. So you feed in, literally millions of training examples of pictures of insects and you label them so you know what they all are and then having done that the the system learns the regularities and their statistical regularities so it just learns the regularities of what mite pictures look like so when you give it a novel mite picture it can say i think that's a mite or i could think that's a spider but it's only done all the intelligence really is what the human's doing putting all of the labeled data in and the computer is just finding the statistical relationships between the input image and the label. That's what neural networks really are. And then 2017, well, about 2016, I think AlphaGo, which was a computer that uh, uh, could play the game Go. And the Go appears to be harder than chess because the board is so much bigger. Can't remember exactly. I think it's 20 by 20. So it, because it's a bigger board, there are so many more possible uh, combinations of what you could have on that board in terms of white and black counters. And the idea is that that gives you an even bigger combina combinatorial explosion. Um, so that, um, that AlphaGo system beat the 
world champion at Go, who's a guy called Lee Seedol, beat him. Uh, and then Google worked on it and built something called Alpha Zero, which could learn to play chess and a few other board games as well from scratch. Um, it could play that in a few hours. The way it did it was adversarial learning. So it had two systems playing each other. And they just looked at all these board positions that appeared and worked out which were good board positions and which were bad board positions and trained a neural network on that to recommend board positions given other board positions. So the other way, that's, that's what you do. You just have to have an awful lot of compute power and run million, billions and billions and billions of chess games. Uh, and then there's some other clever techniques which I won't go into, but essentially that's, that's what it is. So all board games can be solved now to a high degree um, by doing that kind, of, uh, that kind of approach. Okay, so that gives you a bit of a, bit of a timeline. Um, let's just go back to AI, what AI is or isn't. I haven't really sort of specified that. Well, what does it mean? Well, artificial just means it's made by humans, right? It doesn't come from the natural world. It's something we've made. And um, uh, an artifact is a human-made thing. And what does intelligence mean? Well, you know, there are many, many definitions, but from, from our perspective, a, a good sort of scientific definition is doing the right thing at the right time, given the current context. So in a world which is not trivial, so there is some complexity in the world, you have to do the right thing at the right time. It only has meaning if there's some sort of goal. So you're trying to get something done in the world. So you've got a system that's trying to get something done in the world, and it's got to do the right thing at the right time to try and get something done. Okay, so it's a very broad definition, I know, but I think it's the one that really en encompasses all different ways of solving this problem. It's not about technology primarily. It's about a scientific investigation of what intelligence is and how we might simulate it by using computers. Okay, so intelligence about behavior, what a machine does, how it does it is not the measure of intelligence, okay? Only how well it does it. Doesn't matter how it, how, what, what goes in the box, it's how well it does it. So that's, um, I think, a much more helpful way to think about what is and isn't AI. Otherwise, people get very hooked up on, well, this particular type of a way of writing code is AI, and this other particular type of a code way of writing code isn't AI. Yeah, it's to do with behavior. Okay, I think the only other thing I was going to say there is that a, a system exhibits artificial intelligence. That's how we need to think about it. It isn't an AI. There isn't such a thing as an AI. Okay, and that kind of language leads to this anthropomorphic thinking where we start to think about, oh, is this machine conscious? Is it an individual being? Should we be able to turn it off or not? It all comes from othering the AI system, giving it a self, basically. Okay, what can AI systems do today? Well, they can play games. We've covered that better than the best human players. They can recognize faces and objects in images. You know, there's AI in your phone, tracks your image, tra tracks your face, you know, on your phone, on the camera, tracks the faces of other people, um, recognizes objects. That's all easy tech. Now, uh, it can translate between languages, kind of. Have you tried Google Translate, anybody? It works well on some, where there's large corpuses available in both languages, it's well-trained, can work quite well. Um, where there isn't, it's appalling. So it, remember, all it's doing is it's looking at probabilistic links between words in one language and words in another language or phrases. It, it doesn't know what any of the words mean. It's not grounded in anything real. It's just looking at symbols. These are input symbols, output symbols. You can trans transcribe speech. So there may be people now who are who are turned on the speech transcribing in Zoom and are, and are looking at the words that I'm saying as they come out. Um, it can trade stocks. In fact, that's a, a bit of a problem because it can trade stocks very well and extremely fast, which increases volatility in the market. But we know that it can do that. It can write poetry and music. To some degree, it can be creative. There is a lot of philosophical argument about whether what it produces is actually creative or whether it's just a pastiche of other people's ideas rehashed. Some people think that 
computer generated art is valuable other people think it fundamentally can't be valuable because no human was thinking about it when it was made so there is no underlying narrative so there's a picture in the style of turner or something it produces a novel picture in the style of turner no one was thinking about that when they produced it it's just a machine spewing out versions of turner that haven't been produced yet so you know i kind of think it's more that really but other people do think it's authentic so it can do that it can spot cancer in tissue slides uh not better than humans it would seem it can spot cancer in tissue slides almost as well as humans and similarly um uh, uh chest x-rays looking for cancer in chest x-rays uh, about as well as humans but not better not better <laughs> a part of the reason for that may be that uh, the original input data was was all labeled by humans so there will be an error rate in the input data and maybe it's just the system's got the same error rate um, so it's not replacing uh, experts who are looking at these images at all. Uh, well, in some situations, it can sort of drive. I think in the DARPA situation, AI can drive, but not in all situations. Uh, and then, as, as of course, there's this, which is the inevitable clever robot video. So this is the um, Boston Dynamics robot. Um, and in some ways, this is very intelligent, and in many, many ways, it's uh, very little intelligent in it. Um, so there's no CTI here. This is a real robot doing this. This is what you get if you have hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. So um, what is clever about that is, uh, let me just stop it a second. What is clever about that is the lower levels, the control theory. So it's very accurate, it's balancing, it's not falling over. Uh, it's able to yeah, do all that control stuff in, in real time, stand on its little feet and not fall over, just like we humans do. In terms of the moves it's making, they are a predefined set of moves, just like someone at the Olympics learns, a, is given a predefined set of moves that they have to do on a piece of apparatus and they go through and do those. So that robot isn't, deciding to do those backflips and things that's all pre-programmed for it so at the low level there is some intelligent behavior happening you know it doesn't fall over and, and so on um, and also if you put a little stone underneath one of its feet for example it, it wouldn't fall over it can compensate for that so there's some intelligence there but it's it's not making just it's not it's not doing backflips because it's happy <laughs> or because it's showing off uh, so um so there's the robot video. Well, let's just talk about the difference between games and actually useful stuff. So games from noughts and crosses, Sudoku, chess, Go. Sudoku is also very easy to solve. I hope students all have to solve that. They're given Sudoku puzzles, they have to solve them all within a time limit, which is measured in seconds. Like they give his 20 Sudokus, you have to solve them all in five seconds or something. They do that in about week six, one of their courseworks. So uh, you don't need to bother sort of scratching your head anymore about Sudoku. You can just get this bit of software and do it for you. Uh, Rubik's Cube, Space Invaders, Jeopardy, all these things, right? But games are human invented problems set up such that humans find them hard, but can just about solve them. That's what a game is, isn't it? They're hard to be hard, but not so hard that you can't possibly do it because there wouldn't be a game. It'd just be frustration, a bit like uh, golf. Um, <laughs> So uh, here's an example of this. So in 2011, IBM Watson beats these two guys at Jeopardy, which is an American game show. And it was hailed as amazing. This computer has, you know, beaten these guys at Jeopardy. But the, um, the interesting thing about that is that Watson's not a commercial success. It's had some limited success in the market, but it's not a commercial success, really. It's not been the big thing that IBM thought it would be. So although it appeared to be impressive in games, not so impressive in the real world. So real world problems, what do I mean by real world problems? Well, all these things, right? Real world problems, um, finding your way around campus, like when there's no map and, and, and you just have to ask people, you know, you just rock up at Bath campus and someone says, uh, and with the instruction, you know, go, go find Rob Wortham's office. Somehow you have to ask people, you're gonna have to use your common sense, you're gonna have to do things very hard for an AI system to do that. Learning new ideas. So this is like transfer learning. 
So not just learning how to do something that you're being shown how to do, but learning something that's new, synthesizing something that's new, making good decisions without all the facts. Most of the time we have to make decisions, we have to make them without all the facts. We don't have all that we need and it makes it quite hard. Um, and social interaction. So when you drive your car, it's a social interaction in Bath, right? You're looking at people, are they looking at you? Is that lady there? Uh, with her ch toddlers, is she looking at me or not? Is she about to step across on the pavement? That's a social interaction that's happening. She looks at me and I go, oh, do you see me? I'll drive past. If you haven't seen me, I'm going to stop. Um, politics, you know, haven't got all the information. There's a huge amount going on in politics. Very hard in those real world problems. Okay, they're unreachable for today's AI. There's no route through to solving those problems. So let's just go back to this learning from data business. I'll speed up a bit now. So a huge amount of money has been spent uh, in industry and lots of academics, but in industry uh, on machine learning, which is this idea about learning from data, which has been around a long time. Um, and enormous attention and budgets. You can see the budgets here. This is the curve on the, on the right-hand side, kind of histograms going off exponentially, um, the amount of money that's being spent on this. Um, and it requires very large numbers of training cycles. It's probably worth me just explaining this diagram here a little bit. So what we've got is um, how well the uh, artificial intelligence system performs up here, it's performance. Like how many times out of a million does it get the object classification right or drive, not drive the car into a, into a road or into a you know, lamppost or something. And along here is the amount of data you need to supply the system with to get that performance. And these curves are basically different types of uh, machine learning technology. Uh, um, so we've been doing better with different types of machine learning technology, but we're now on this deep neural networks. And you can see it's flattening off. It's an S-shaped curve. These are all S-shaped curves. It's flattening off. So to get better performance, we need huge, huge, huge amounts of data. And we only get sort of small increments in performance. And um, that's, what, that's really what you're seeing everywhere. Most of the research now is focused on optimizations. So ways of being able to get the same performance with a bit less data, ways of doing this without using up all the energy that's in Belgium, you know, the amount of Bitcoin that's being mined is using the same amount of energy as Belgium uses at the moment. Uh, so the, the, this is, um, um, this here is ImageNet. ImageNet is a standard set of images. And the idea is you train the image, tra train your AI system on all these images, and then you see, you know, what performance you get out of it. And what you can see is over the years, there's an S curve. So big performance in early days, uh, 2011 onwards, and then now much, much smaller improvement as they pump more and more money into trying to get this to be better. But the, the, the red line is uh, what humans can achieve. So um, machine learning, although it has you know, delivered quite a lot, it's not the way forward to producing general AI, solving all these AI problems. It's a useful technology that solves a certain set of problems. Okay, so we need some new ideas. That's the key thing in AI. To move AI forward now, everyone who's working on this pretty much says we need some new ideas. Um, so there are alternative approaches. There are, um, we may need to return back to some old approaches, which were symbolic, this type of things which were being worked on by uh, um, those guys at the Dartmouth College, which were actually using symbols, language like symbols, programming languages, if you like, uh, rather than just computing weights and numbers in a neural network. Um, and there's some guys that have been working on that. There's Alan Newell's names popped up again. There he is from the original uh, thing. And the idea is that we build something which looks a little bit like, you know, a map, uh, a way that the, your brain works. You have working memory and declarative memory, procedural memory, and you have interfaces between these different types of memory that are going on and decisions are being made. Um, so much more uh, of a, a system where you could inspect and look inside and see exactly what's happening as the system runs. We're going to go back, I think, to some of those kinds of of ideas. Um, for a long time now, there's just been very little investment and there's just a handful of small academic research projects, no big money. Um, but if you look now at what people are saying, so some of you in the room might know these people, Andrew Ung at, at, at uh, he was Google and Baidu, Stuart Russell at Berkeley, 
Jan LeCun, who's at Facebook, um, Gary Marcus, and um, various other people who've recently set up a company called Robust AI in 2016. Um, these are the big names, and they're saying, oh, we need to have a hybrid approach now. We need to say, okay, we've got machine learning, but we need some symbolic approaches as well. And we need to join those two things together. And that's very difficult. You perceive that you think in symbols, and I'm transmitting symbols to you now, right? Word symbols. So that's symbols. But if you look in my head, you can't find any symbols. When you look inside my head, you just see neurons firing and electrical pulses happening. So where are the symbols? Because you can't find them inside, but they seem to be coming out on the outside. That is the, exactly the challenge that we have. How do we, how do we sort of uh, bridge this gap between two ways of thinking about the world? One is about weights and pulses and, and neurons, and the other is about symbols. Okay. I just also want to just say about that intelligence requires computation, okay? Any kind of, of computation. So this is computation is just converting information from one form into another form, right? It doesn't need a digital computer, it could be an analog computer, it could be a brain. Computation is a physical process and it needs three things. What do we think those three things are? Three things? To do computation, you need three things. You need to nuance the problem. You need to understand. You need to understand the problem. Yes, you do. There are three physical things that you need to do computation. It's a physical process. You need energy. You need some kind of energy, right, to do work. We're going to do some work. You need energy. We need some space to do that work in, and we need some time. Those of you who've got some engineering physics will know that you can't have energy without time, because otherwise you'd have like infinite power. <laughs> so it's, if we're going to burn some energy, we have to burn it over time. And so uh, and we have to burn that in some space because otherwise we've got infinite energy density and we can't have that either. So we need energy space and we need time. Intelligence requires work. Harder problems require more work. You're already seeing that, right? Training these big deep learning algorithms using huge amounts of energy. There's no magic algorithm to bypass this. There's no kind of silver bullet that will solve this problem. Um, uh, the intelligence you have, it depends on context. So there can be no general intelligence. Humans are not generally intelligent, right? In fact, we're generally unintelligent. There's many, many more things we're rubbish at doing than things that we are good at doing. Most of us can't even play chess very well. So, um, yeah, we're not generally intelligent. And so this idea of artificial general intelligence, this idea that, that artificial intelligence is a, as a systemic existential threat, that's sci-fi. That's definitely just sci-fi. Um, and less and less people are postulating that idea now. So AI is an interdisciplinary approach. I'll speed up a little bit now because time's going on, but it's, a, it's an approach to solving this problem of how do we generate intelligence? Um, how do we understand intelligence and how do we generate intelligent machines? And it takes all these disciplines together. And this is when we really start to solve problems, when we bring all of these things together. There's one that's not there, which is this one, really important, evolutionary biology. So the planet has been searching for better solutions to problems for three billion years, ever since there was life on the planet, right? And we know that because the things that work well got into the next generation. Things that didn't work so well didn't make it to the next generation. That's how evolution works. So it's a blind search. It's not a directed search, but it's a search looking for increasing fitness. And it's gone on on a planetary scale for 3 billion years. So it's come up with some jolly good answers. And that's why we need evolutionary biologists to influence our thinking about how we build intelligent systems. Together with you know, computer engineers, mathematicians, you know, economists, philosophers, very important as well. Then we need to have some clear thinking and philosophers are the other people that kind of can deliver clear thinking. Um, yeah, so all of those things are all part of what AI is. I just want to mention about AI winters. We're going to drag on a little bit now, but I will just mention about that. So here's that, um, that timeline again. There were a number of things called uh, times when AI was very out of vogue, out of favour. There are two here. One's the Light Hill Report in 1973, which I will mention. Uh, and the other is this 
business of expert systems, which happened in the 90s. And some of you might remember expert systems in the 90s. Let's look at those two things. Well, <laughs> the light hail induced AI winter, 1973. So Sir James, uh, Sir Michael James, James Lighthill, his name was, was a mathematician at Cambridge. He was uh, commissioned by the government to produce a report on AI and a general survey, how well AI promised against. The problem was that everyone over promises what AI can do. And then of course, disappointment sets in because they spend lots of money and don't get what they thought they were gonna get. And you can watch this, this is on YouTube. If you Google what that says at the top there, you can watch this debate for yourself. It's 90 minutes. So Lighthill sat in this kind of uh, wizard's chair at the top here. He was judge and jury and actually turned out to be executioner as well. And these people here are, are the poor people who are being quizzed about their appalling AI uh, developments. This guy here with the gray hair now is John McCarthy. So he's the guy who was right at the beginning at Dartmouth. He's now here being quizzed and not doing a very good job. And Lighthill, rather like Putin did recently, right? <laughs> he, he basically just got each of them to talk and then he demolished what they had to say. <laughs> um, because, yeah, from, from his perspective, no, no, in no part of the field have the discoveries made so far produced the major impact that was promised. And this was all about Science Research Council funding. They were defunded after this for, for several years, for many years, really, right through the 70s and into the eight, early 80s. They were defunded and there was no AI research happening um, at all as a result of Light Hills. So it was a huge AI winter. Um, and you, uh, it's fascinating to watch. Absolutely. It was broadcast on the BBC for 90 minutes, this one. Still available. So the other sort of real dead end was this expert systems dead end, which happened in the, in the uh, end of the 80s and the 90s. So the idea is that you have a knowledge base, so humans contribute knowledge. You have an inference engine, which kind of infers from knowledge uh, in such a way that users can query the system. And the inference engine looks all the human knowledge, which is embedded and uh, gives you back, you know, the answers that experts would give to your particular problem. Sounds ideal for medical diagnosis and treatment or engineering systems diagnosis and repair. Um, so the idea is you don't need the human there. You can just suck all the knowledge out of the human, put it into the knowledge base. This is a great idea, isn't it? This is, a, I mean, it, it is. It's kind of a great idea. I worked on it a little bit back then. Uh, there's three problems, which unfortunately, at least one of these is a showstopper with this. Um, it's hard to get the rules from experts. That's the first thing experts don't tell you what the actual rules are. You need to ask the right questions. Some of the facts and the rules that go into this knowledge base will be wrong, inevitably, very will be wrong. Generally, the rules will contradict, right? Because we humans, we don't have monotonic logic in our brains. We don't think like that. So... Um, you need to at least have non-monotonic logic reasoning, but, but essentially, you know, you're going to have contradicting things in the database. And most importantly, the, it's very hard to maintain these systems and to scale. Once there's 10,000 rules in there and it's not giving you quite the right answer, which rule do you go and edit? How do you edit? If I take it out, what else will it mess up? It may mess up something else. I don't touch it. So all, the only thing I can do is to put another overriding rule in, say, in this special case, Ignore that rule and we'll have this rule. And so that goes on and goes on. And no one dare touch this rule base. So it's fine, still used for very simple systems, you know, little sort of diagnosis of small systems and so on, fine for very toy problems, but very hard to maintain and scale for anything significant. Okay, um, my time is probably very much up now, but um, I would say this. So. An informed perspective of AI, I remember these guys with their two month study, they were gonna solve AI. I would say, and I did say this in 2020, and please quote me in 2040, if solving human level AI is a two month workshop, then it's currently coffee break on the first morning. So all they've done is sat down, said hello to each other and said, this is the problem. And they've then had coffee, but they didn't even really fully understand the problem. That's where I think we are. We don't really understand the problem of intelligence, which is why we can't really solve it yet. It's early, early days. So that's where we are, and it's not going to take over the world. Okay, so this is just all summary. Um, 
Yeah, AI practitioners have always promised too much. So just they do that to get the funding. That's why they promise too much. And uh, businesses promise too much. They do that to make sales. That's what Google does. It moves from, from research area to research area, never really gets where it's going. But AI techniques now do produce powerful socio-technical tools. Okay, and they're socio-technical because they, they basically suck in human-generated data and the outputs affect humans. So they're not just bits of technology, they're bits of technology and data embodied to kind of together. And, um, and these are very powerful tools for either good or harm, depends who's got them in their hands. Uh, yeah. Okay, if you were here for the rest of the lectures, which you're not, if you were coming here for the other 21 lectures, then the next thing we would cover is this, is the roadmap problem, okay? So we'd work out how to do the roadmap problem and that's, where, that's what would be next. So that's what we cover in AI, those kinds of, how do we solve this problem of the computational explosion? How do we start to chip away at this to come up with some good, intelligent um, solutions to large, complex problems? And uh, I'm done. Thank you very much. And I apologize. I was six minutes over. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. And, You're welcome. Uh, what a counter to the history of artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is a downward conference. In it was a bit of a counter, history. wasn't it? No, but it's great. I think uh, we've covered all the basics. And uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Uh, just for the benefit of the chat room, yeah. they've been remarkably quiet. So uh, there's a couple of questions which we will uh, talk about in a minute. But uh, let's start off in the room. And if you raise your hand, and I just put the microphone here, you don't just handle it because of COVID. So who wants to go first? I think the audience here has stunned as book. John, over to you. Great lecture, Rob. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great lecture. Thank you very much. Do you do you think thinking about your very last point about them being useful socio technological tools? Yes. Do you, do you think that curve is going to continue going up, or do you think you know big tech is going to think, oh, this was a bet that didn't work? Oh, that's interesting. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to stop the screen sharing, and I've clicked the wrong icon. Let me just turn off the screen sharing. I used to know how to do this. Oh, it's the thing at the top, isn't it? That's right. It's the thing at the top that says stop sharing. There we are. Um, okay, so what do I think? I think big tech will have to find some way out of this without losing face because big tech is making lots of money on other things, right? Uh, and so... Right. So, for example, Google were big into robotics. They were they were doing lots and lots of stuff with robotics at one point. Their top guys were writing papers on robotics. Then all of a sudden they realized the limitations of our current AI approaches in robotics. And so they didn't kill it. They just defunded it. It's now a small thing. They have a robot department. They have robots. They have probably hundreds of people working on it. But it, relatively to the size of Google, it's now, you know, small, small beer. Um, uh, uh, that there was all the health thing, right? They were going to solve the problems in healthcare. That's what Google went on to next. Haven't done that terribly well. Couldn't get better than human performance on on X-rays. You know, diagnosing of diagnosis, medical diagnosis of X-ray scans or whatever. Um, so they've moved on, and and so they went on to a, a what is kind of a uh, like a games type problem, which was AlphaFold. That's where they went. So this is protein folding. So how do proteins actually fold up? And they've solved that problem now. So they can, for all the, hum all the proteins that there are that, that are in the human body, which is thousands of different proteins, uh, they can work out how they fold because the way in which proteins fold uh, um, defines their behavior. And um, so that's what I think they'll do. They'll just move to the next thing and, under and defund the other thing. Uh, and... Uh, and they'll stop talking about it slowly and just move on to the next, whatever the next hot thing is that tech companies want to move on to. Yeah. Remember, anything that is already solved isn't AI anymore. Have you noticed that? So, you know, so face recognition isn't AI. It's just face recognition, for example. And that's part of the challenge of AI is why you don't see the successes. They're just called other things now. 
Erdogan, the question is why is evolutionary biology not part, not on the table? It's an interdisciplinary approach to this. You said one was missing. Oh, no, it is, it is there. No, it is, it is a very important part, yes. Uh, the reason I singled it out is because I think a lot of people um, uh, would think that it's something unrelated to artificial oh, intelligence. Um, whereas, I, you know, because it, 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 obviously you think about computers and maths and you might think a bit about philosophy, but you probably wouldn't think about evolutionary biology. But I just singled it out to think it is really, really important. Clarification. Um, I'm trying to medical background. We talked a little bit about image analysis with the solid DNA, yeah. right? but I'm interested that you keep using the target of, of being as good as a human. Yeah. Whereas really the target should be that AI and the human in combination is better than either alone. So, and you also talk about data sets where the human has made mistakes. Well, what you really need to be doing is training the AI to get rid of all the equipment that bore the radiologist, and then for the AI to be trained on the ones that the doctors got wrong, so that they make different mistakes, and therefore the combination of the two together is better than either. Of yeah, yeah, and I, I think if you if you if you have that kind of um, instrumentalist approach, that AI is a tool that people use to help them in their work, then that's absolutely right. If you can strip out with some high degree of confidence, all the easy ones, as you say, then that's ideal. But um, the the idea was the I original idea behind AI was to try and achieve human level intelligence, and we're clearly not doing that if we can't replace the humans in all circumstances. So um, that's that's really where we're sort of hitting this wall of not being able to improve beyond a certain level that isn't as good as humans. But I, I quite agree with you. I think it, 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 that there are AI enabled tools or however you would like to describe it, it's certainly a, um, uh, a way forward for trying to, for example, another example would be in engineering where uh, you can do generative design on, um, so you've got a bracket, for example, and you, you want it to withstand a certain amount of force, but you want it to go into an aeroplane or a spaceship or something. You want it to be as light as possible. So there's a standard way of doing that in engineering, which is that you design it and then you just drill circular holes in it to, to, to reduce the amount of mass. And you run it through a finite element analysis system and check whether it's still rigid enough and will take the load. And then you build one like that. And But if you allow artificial intelligence, generative type techniques, in fact, um, yeah, a bit like mutations, and like the way that um, that, uh, that, that evolutionary biology works, uh, you end up with some really weird looking shapes and you find that there's less material in them and they're more rigid and they'll take more weight. A bit like if you look at the way human bones are, right? They're very, very complex structures with strange little nobbles in places and they're you know, not simple things, human bones. And, and, and there's this honeycomb inside and so on. And that's because that's, that's been through the same process of many, many generations, adjusting it, fine tuning it. So, um, so engineers are now using that kind of an approach. And because we've got 3D printing, we've got additive manufacturing, we can now actually produce things like that. We don't have to start with a block or a sheet of metal and then take pieces away. It's not subtractive, it's now additive. We can actually build material in any shape we want to. So that's just another example of, of, of using it as a tool. Yeah. yeah. Yes, so there was a thing called the Human Brain Project, which had, uh, I think, a billion euros thrown at it. And the idea was to understand the human brain. Um, I'm not a neuroscientist, but... Um, so there's about 4 billion neurons in your brain. And a neuron has got very little to do with a neural neuron in a neural network of a, of a computer. That's a much simpler thing in the computer. A, ne a neuron, a biological neuron, is a very complicated uh, thing. It takes a huge amount of computational power just to generate, to simulate one human neuron. Uh, we've got 4 billion in our brain, and they're all wired together with trillions of connections. And as I say, when you look at the signals that are generated, 
very hard to make any sense of it all. Now, that's not that some sense hasn't been made. Obviously, it has. But there's no module there. It's not like kind of, well, there's this bit here of your brain which does, you know, uh, making cups of tea and there's this bit of your brain over here that does reading poetry and there's this bit of your brain that lights something. It seems that your brain has many modes it can configure itself into and it reuses the same machinery for, in, in many, many areas. So the bits of your brain that light up when you do things, there's huge overlaps in that. So it's not clear how you would map from that to some sort of artificial machine. The Human Brain Project, the idea was to scan... Um, a human brain down to individual neurons and all the connections. So you build some sort of map of a real brain and then you take that map and you program a computer with it and you'd run it so as to create a sort of artificial person that you'd scan, right? <laughs> and in the sci-fi world, the idea would be if you could produce exactly the same thing, you would have produced that copy of that person, but now running in silicon. But that's sci-fi for many, many reasons, not just the complexity, but um, the complexity is completely beyond anything we could we could do at the moment. Yeah. I don't think anybody spotted it, but I think Rob Dundas started it. It's not four billion neurons, it's about a hundred billion neurons. Is it as many as that? And, and it's up to 25,000 connections each. Yeah, yeah, and up to. It comes back to your earlier computation. That actually makes it more potential connections than are now in any particles in the universe. So again, it's, 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 it's a, it's a mind-boggling thing, the brain, in terms of how it actually does. Yeah, if they'd started with the nematode worm, so a nematode worm is a microscopic worm, uh, every nematode worm has the same brain and it has 914 neurons in it. Yeah. And so you could actually simulate that. And that's just been done recently. So we can now simulate the brain of a nematode worm, which I think is an amazing achievement, right? But that's an actual practical achievement. So we can, we can get the same responses from the nematode. If we were to try and draw out uh, using a little small pen on, on, the, on the walls of this room, just up the flow chart for how a nematode worm processes its information and organizes it and makes decisions in the world, you wouldn't be enough on all these walls. That's just a little tiny worm thing with 914 neurons. But if we'd started with that, we would have perceived we'd been successful. But because we started with human level, we're doomed to failure. Yeah. Uh, but to the gentleman, there's a Nobel Prize winner called Gerald Eagle. So you might want to look him up. And he does neural nets, and I think he's got creatures called Darwin, Darwin wants to tell us. And I think he's got as far as having a neural net the size, half the size of a bird's yeah. uh, bee's brain. Doesn't sound much. Andreas, there's some questions on the chat here. Do we want to? Yeah, do we want me to? There's a gentleman there. Okay. The okay, very good. Be very patient. <laughs> I just wanted to ask. Um, does AI have anything to say about consciousness? Is it, is it something that we uh, think is important to be included in the way we are um, Within the field, there are some people who think AI is very relevant to consciousness and very important, uh, and other people who um, would not think consciousness is such a big issue. I'm in the camp who don't think consciousness is a big issue. Consciousness is a phenomenological observation okay you observe yourself internally and you perceive that you are conscious you can't perceive that anybody else is conscious just by looking at external behavior because you could argue that you could this bit of philosophy this really you could argue that, that that could be replicated that behavior without there being any consciousness in anybody else so you're only aware of i think i think therefore i am right so Descartes. So it's only you can only uh, have consciousness in your own. So therefore, some people have a big view of consciousness. They call it the hard problem. And other people think, well, this is just a reflective process that kind of a monitoring. And that's where I am, really, that consciousness is a, a, a monitoring process that is aware of you thinking, aware, aware of your brain, you know, processing stimuli and uh, thinking about thinking about thinking. Right. It's about thinking about thinking. Well, that's a very useful process to have. It keeps you focused on the task. It, 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 you know, there's a whole set of benefits of being of, of that kind of consciousness. 
Um, so that's what I think consciousness is. But there are other people who think it's a better, like David Chalmers, for example, who's a panpsychist, really like AI guy, a philosopher, but he's a panpsychist. He thinks that everything in the universe has a little bit of consciousness in it. It's just that when you put it together in the structure of the human brain, you get a lot more consciousness. I mean, for me, that's a kind of crazy, but there's serious people who believe that. So there's a huge continuum and consciousness is a, if you want to read up on it, read uh, Dan Dennett's Consciousness Explained, which I think is a brilliant book, 500 pages, but a brilliant book that deals with the problem of consciousness and kind of, I felt really sort of settled it for me. Yeah. Okay, we've got a similar question from Will in the chat room. Yeah. He says, you seem to be defining intelligence as entirely separate from consciousness. Do you think a machine can ever be conscious? Now, based on your definition of consciousness, knowing that it's doing something, yeah. it's being self-aware that it's yeah. actually performing certain tasks. Yeah. Do you think a machine... So based on that definition, I think it's... Abs yes, I think many machines are conscious are based on that definition, that they monitor their internal processes and regulate what they're doing. They're aware of what they're, they're aware of the processes that's, that are running within the computer. So uh, I, would, I would say that uh, to that definition, it's a commonplace thing. And the soteriology of the whole thing in terms of purpose, does it really be aware of why it's doing it? Ha. So what so so the idea that there is or has to be a purpose and that there is a higher purpose is as you say a teleological one. Yeah. And um I don't see the need for it. I don't think there is an, a, a, a requirement for there to be an innate purpose for things. Systems just do what systems do based on their stimuli and the structure of the system and the amount of energy that's around. They just do what they do. Okay. Yeah. And the similar thing is, uh, I think we've alluded to that earlier, how far are we from general artificial intelligence? Yes, so no one knows what gen art artificial general intelligence is. No one can define it other than they say, well, it's you know, better than human in all areas. Uh, and no one knows how you might build that or how you might measure it or anything about it. I think it's a, uh, a thought experiment or a, a, a fancy. It's a kind of fancy, you know, it's um, not something to be taken very seriously. But, but let's have it in sci-fi movies because it's great. Well, let's press you, let's press you a little bit further on this yes. AGI. Yeah. And that is... What if we just equated AGI as far as a machine or soft AI yeah. being able to do general tasks like human, general tasks in a general way rather than just specific tasks. So they would be able to sustain themselves. They would be able to replicate all the things that humans learn and, and do everyday tasks, but across the whole spectrum of the daily tasks. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to do all the things that a human needs to do you need to be a human. Yeah. So if you could build a human, then you could, you know, then that's fine. But I mean, we know how to build humans, right? It's a biological process. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, the idea of building is, 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 is comes from a me mechanical idea, doesn't it? That we construct, solder it together or, or weld it together or, or 3D print it or something, mechanical sort of business. You're not going to take from that route forwards. You're not going to build data on Star Trek. You're not. Far too many moving parts needed. You heard it here first, okay? Yeah. You heard I don't think it's a controversial. It's really not a controversial viewpoint. Not, not amongst scientists, not amongst people that understand AI. Most people who work in machine learning get a bit embarrassed when you start talking about the capabilities of AI. They keep saying... Please just talk about a system that discovers statistical regularities and data sets, because that's really what we're doing. We're in the business here of applied statistics. That's really what we're doing. And we're getting quite good at that, but that's what we do. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, the questions are out in the chat room. Any questions in the room? Yeah. Well, I have another controversial one. What about Elon Musk? Yeah. His Neural uploading project. Neural lace. That yeah. was it, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was going to sort of have a, I think. He's still trying, isn't I it? think something's happened with that, hasn't it? Some sort of irreversible process of putting 
electrical connections into your brain, deep into your brain, that can't then be removed. And the, the idea is you put all of these connections in and you can sense the brain deeply. And somehow you can take that information that you get from there and transfer yourself into a machine into another machine it is just sci-fi and i don't even want to try and think about it because it kind of gives it credibility i think it's mad <laughs> we'll, we'll, finish, we'll finish on the note of madness and sci-fi unless anybody else has got any more questions no okay well, let's uh, give Rob another big round of applause for an excellent talk tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then uh, I just talked to you about two events coming up in May uh, for uh, World Affairs. We're having a talk by two of the co-editors of the latest uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report giving their view. So this is quite useful. These are actually authors uh, of the report. who are going to give us their review, view of where we are with climate change, how desperate it is, and whether uh, there is still room to mitigate rather than just to prepare and adapt to climate change. So that should be a good one in May. And also on the business and economics front, we have a talk about levelling up. You will have all heard that the Tory government have said a lot about levelling up and the the powerhouse of the north, where we have uh, Professor McCann from Sheffield University, so suitably based in the north, coming to give us a talk in terms of what levelling up is, how it could be facilitated, and how far away we are from that. So that's it in May. So uh, have a safe journey home, and uh, hopefully we'll see each other again in person in May. All the very best. Bye-bye.